things, then we'll start. All right, thank you all for joining us. Uh, just want to give you a quick reminder, we have a lot of folks here today. We'd like to get through as many questions as we can, so we encourage everybody to be respectful of your fellow citizens. Uh, the way the format works is the congressman is going to give us an update on the things he's working on in Washington, and then we're going to go into your questions. When you, get, when you came in, you should have had a chance to fill out a quick comment card. We pick the questions at random out of the purple bucket, and uh, that way, if we, for some reason, if we don't get to all the questions, you will get a written response um, on your topic. So Lauren's going to be picking those out uh, when we get to, to that point. So uh, before we get started, I'm going to turn it back over to Congressman Grothman and ask you to all uh, please rise if you were able and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, here's Congressman Grothman. Well, I can always I'm going to try to give you an update on what's going on in Washington. Maybe touch on some things that aren't in the news. Oh, by the way, i got to say Michael Schraz here. Uh, like Al said, I will be asking your questions, but if the questions get too tough, we're going to give it to Michael over here <laughs> to deal with those. Um, but first thing I'm going to go through, I'm going to lead off by uh, going through, by going through uh, a few of the things that are going on. The thing that's in the paper most recently is the debt limit. Um, obviously, it's something that's got to be dealt with. Traditionally, however, when the debt limit comes up, we also try to do a little bit with the government spending that right now is a problem. I know you've been hearing about government debt for your entire lifetime, so it's easy to let your eyes, uh, eyes glaze over when I talk about it, but I really feel we have a, a, something that's unprecedented in my lifetime. At the end of World War II, the total debt was equal to about 100% of GDP, okay? But at that time, we knew they were going to lay off millions of people in the military. We knew they were going to stop making tanks and planes and ships and everything. So we could see that the government was eventually going to reduce spending. And that's what happened. We went from having a, a, a debt of equal to about 100% of about GDP going all the way down to a little over 20% or Nixon. It then slowly went up. But the last few years, in part because of COVID, and I would argue in part because of some unprecedented bills, by President Biden, we're approaching 100% again. I am not going to cut Social Security. We're not going to reduce Medicare. Um, but because our population is getting older, you can see the cost of those programs is going to go up. And there are no programs that are going to obviously go down. So it's important that we take every chance we can to try to level off the amount of spending that's out there. Um, last week, the Republicans did pass a Republican position, which is taking uh, what we call discretionary spending back to what it was only a year ago. I don't think that's outrageous. Um, I think President Biden was not willing to negotiate with the Republicans at that time because he felt the Republicans would never be able to get their act together and get 218 votes for any bill. That bill did pass 217 to 215. Now, President Biden does say he's going to meet with Kevin McCarthy, who's the head Republican in the House. He's going to meet with Mitch McConnell. He's going to meet with the two uh, Democrat counterparts. Hopefully, we'll make some dent in this spending. I, we are not going to reach a compromise going all the way back to where we were a year ago, but hopefully we can reach some sort of compromise. We do have a provision there that I'm in favor of with work requirements for people on food stamps or some other welfare type programs. Um, I think that is overwhelmingly popular with the public. I think there is no reason uh, President Biden can't give us at least that amount, but we'll see what he, he gives us. We know ultimately we have to raise the debt limit. It would be very bad for the government if we were to default on our debt. But like I said, there have been times in the past where we use the debt limit as a time to kind of reach back and say, where are we on the overall level? government spending. And I hope that that's what happens. Uh, we are also working on the, the uh, budget for the fiscal year beginning October 1st. And uh, President Biden has submitted his budget in many of the items in that budget. Many of the agencies are getting 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 percent increases. 
And I hope the Republicans stand firm against that. We have got to stop having 9 or 10 percent increases in any lines in our budget. Something else in that budget that bothers me a great deal, we'll be talking about a little bit more, is he's got a lot more um, diversity, inclusion stuff in every government agency. That's the type of stuff where I think these individual agencies are going to be weighing in on the race, on the gender, on the sexual preference of people being hired. Uh, they're going to weigh in on who's getting the grants. I think that's just a cancer on our country. It's one of the things that I disagree with President Biden the most on. I'm going to come back and talk about that in a second. But it is, his proposed budget is just littered with new bureaucracies, you know, making decisions based on where a person's ancestors were years ago or something. Uh, the next topic is the border. I hadn't been on the border for about nine months, but I did get back down there for two days a couple weeks ago, and we still have a big problem down there. Um, one of the things we had a chance to see, I was um, driven along the border by a member, or by the head of the union in the Tucson sector. So you understand, this part of the border was on uh, Indian Reservation, straddling Arizona and Mexico. Um, I say it's a desert, and usually when you think of a desert, you think of sand. This is really more like rocks. I mean, we drove, it had to be 30 miles along there. I don't know that we were ever over 20 miles an hour, probably over 15 miles. We got 10 or 15 miles in, away from anybody else who ran across 21 people from Mexico. I think two of them looked to be children who were under one year of age. Um, the question is, why were they crossing in the middle of nowhere rather than crossing and asking for asylum on, on a road? And the reason is the Mexican drug cartels run the border. And they want some people to come across in the middle of nowhere because they know that if the Border Patrol has to come and catch these people or get these people, they've got to spend time driving them back to headquarters, processing them, and they know that that segment of the border is going to be wide open. Where everywhere on the border there, there are big mountains, and there are the drug cartels have people with equipment in those mountains seeing whether or not they can spot anybody coming across. A lot of times that equipment is more sophisticated than the equipment the Border Patrol has themselves. Uh, so in any event, they got these people who walked two hours through the Mexican desert to get there. They sat there for another two hours waiting for us to come by. And it was unusual that we came by, if it weren't for us two congressmen on a tour, who knows how long they would have sat there. So uh, a real bad situation. One more anecdote on that to give you what I would say is the lack of seriousness of the Biden administration. As we know, a lot of drugs come across the southern border. 107,000 Americans die every year of illegal drugs. Um, they should be cracking down on it. I talked to the head of the union, do you want more dogs? Because I've seen what a good job the dogs do as far as identifying, um, identifying the illegal drugs. Our guide said, no, we just got 38 dogs. The Biden administration did provide dogs, but they didn't help us with the drugs. They heard that the Border Patrol was stressed, and these are therapy dogs to make the Border Patrol feel better. They haven't put that in the paper, but it gives you the mindset of what's going on in the people, you know, the people in charge right now. The fact that they would want therapy dogs instead of spending the money on drug sniffing dogs. The other thing I will talk about on the border, um, I right now am in charge of a subcommittee which deals with the, the military but also deals with the border. Um, we, uh, we looked into the unaccompanied minors down here, um, just as the overall number of people are coming across the southern border. And a couple of Januarys ago, it was under 20,000. Now it's over 220,000. The number of unaccompanied minors People that might be 15 or 16, they might be 9 or 10, showing up at the border is also going up. We've got right now eight to 9,000 unaccompanied minors going, going across the border. We interviewed the Office of Refugee Resettlement, and quite frankly, I was surprised how little they were doing and little they knew about what's going on down there. Um, according to the New York Times, there are 85,000 minors which are right now unaccompanied for. 
Um, a lot of these miners have to send money back home because the cartels run the southern border. They charge people to come here. And sometimes what they do is the people have to remit the money to relatives, maybe in Central America or something like that. So uh, potential there, obviously, for abusing the miners, mistreating them. Uh, I know President Trump was under attack for having miners apart from their parents when the parents broke the law for a couple of weeks. Here you have people who may never see their, their uh, parents again. One of the things that disappointed me is, you know, all these kids when they come across are given sponsors. And you would hope the sponsors are appropriately vetted and that the parents are signing off with the sponsors. The Office of Refugee Resettlement could not give us any numbers on the number of parents they were able to contact. And people do have cell phones today in you know, Guatemala, Honduras. It seems like all the um, illegals who come across the southern border have cell phones. But we had no idea how many parents were being talked to. You could say the kids wound up with an aunt or uncle or something, but it could be a male uncle with three other guys in the house or something or other. Uh, I was very disappointed that <coughs> they knew with where these kids showed up. And uh, hopefully, we'll be able to put more money in the future budget to monitor what's going on there. Um, I did say as part of the budget, and I come back to this diversity and equity thing that the Biden administration is obsessed with. You will recall, it was one of the few Republicans to show up for his inauguration, but President Biden talked about racism, I think, four times and white supremacy once in his inaugural speech. And he talked about racism again, ac um, accusing law enforcement of racism in his annual, annual State of the Union address, which I don't like. Um, not long after he took office, two Democrat senators, Tammy Duckworth of Illinois and Macy Hirano of Hawaii, um, told President Biden they didn't want him appointing any more white men uh, as far as his appointments were concerned, unless they were gay. Um, President Biden met with them. I assume you held their hand told them there were some white guys he wanted to appoint, and could they let those through. Nevertheless, a legal journal um, recently did a study of the 97 judges that President Biden has appointed uh, in his first two years. Of those 97 judges, only five have been white men, and from what we can tell, two of those white men are gay. So he really only had three heterosexual white men out of 97 judges. So President Biden, at least with regard to judges, is kind of going right down that path. And uh, it's something I wish the press would talk a little, about a little bit more. He has many other political appointees. And it, it bothers me because I think it is so potentially divisive. You know, America has traditionally been a country in which I think we all look out for the country as a whole. When you divide the country, it creates problems. As long as I've been interested in politics my whole life, I think they have problems in Canada because they have the French-speaking Canadians and the English-speaking Canadians. We know whenever you read about elections in Africa, um, you have different tribes. And the elections, rather than argues about policy, seem to be arguments about which tribe is going to be in control. You read about Indian politics, it's the Hindus and the Muslims. So you read about um, Iraq, it's the Shiites against the Sunnis. We don't want that to happen here, and that's one of the reasons why I'm so mad at President Biden for elevating all of this affirmative action stuff. We have had affirmative action in this country since 1965. It affects who gets hired in government. It affects who gets hired in any business that does over $10,000 of business with the government. It affects admissions to colleges and universities, and it affects government contracting. Uh, I was hoping that affirmative action would be phased out, but instead President Biden is kind of putting it on steroids and this idea that we try to divide America or that Americans should think of themselves as a subgroup is something he's pushing. One other thing I am fighting in Washington, right now the minorities that they keep statistics on, uh, I hate the word minority, but uh, would be people from Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, um, Native American, Pacific Islander, and Asian. And right now, Asian, if you think of a map, um, they keep track of people from Japan, China, Vietnam, 
Burma, India, Pakistan, and they stop there. You're no longer considered, a, I guess, a special class, a minority, if you're from Iran, Iraq, Syria, Egypt, Algeria. President Biden, it appears, is going to try to change that and add uh, those folks in as minorities and kind of in need of special protection as well. Um, I think that's a mistake. They wind up with a situation, particularly at a time of great immigration here in America, which is a practical matter. You're going to be giving people who just show up here preferences over people who have been here for generations. I don't think it's fair, but above all, I think it's a bad idea because it does lead to divisiveness in America. And clearly the goal is to have as many Americans as possible walk around with a chip on their shoulder and feel they should be entitled to something, or if I don't get what I want, it must be because, because of racism or that sort of thing. And uh, we'll see what happens, but I will continue to be critical of the Biden administration. And I thought it was really wrong of those two uh, senators to, in essence, say they're going to do what we can to prevent more um, white guys from being uh, approved uh, and appointees. Okay, now what we'll do is uh, I will come back to some other issues, but we'll start by taking a couple questions now. By the way, we have a couple of people here from my Washington office. Uh, this is Lauren. We maybe talk to her on the phone if you deal with policy, but uh, we have about seven staffers <coughs> in Washington and seven staffers in Fond du Lac. Um, I think it's good from time to time to bring the people from Washington back here so they know that when people are speaking to them on the phone, they're real people and they can get to learn a little bit more about Wisconsin. So we're really glad to have her and Danny here today. All right, so first off, we'll have Mike from Fond du Lac uh, concerning the new mortgage subsidy along with um, some illegal immigration concerns. Okay, Michael. Yeah, <clears throat> with this new um, mortgage subsidy where, yeah. um, is it possible just to have a, a bill just with that as a single issue to repeal that? And we are put working on a bill like okay. that. It takes a while to get the bill <clears throat> drafting. Uh, we have signed a letter with other congressmen uh, trying to discourage this sort of thing by happening. I, I will tell you what bothers me so much. It's like they are doing all they can to encourage division with the affirmative action, but also encourage irresponsibility, right? We have many, many programs which you're only eligible for if you don't work that hard or if, if you're not married. And <coughs> we, have, we have programs in which you try to um, uh, get rid of student loan debt so the people who pay their student loan debt, they get nothing, but if you didn't pay your student loan debt, they get forgiveness. And now we have this ridiculous program in which you're penalized for saving money and being at credit risk. And if you, if you said we're going to go down the path of punishing people who have a high credit rating uh, at the expense of people who have a low credit rating, I mean, you always can have bad luck in your life, but it, it's obviously ridiculous. And we'll do what we can to highlight it. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to beat it back. But it's, it's just. Ridiculous, and like I said, you are one more time penalizing the frugal, and I always thought it was good to be frugal at the expense of people who have a lower rating. Oh, okay. well, and then I'm with sure. uh, with immigration, I know that the Biden administration is not going to enforce anything, but have is there been consideration to just um, not allow any kind of federal aid for non-citizens? I think that would. Um, they should be able to get it now. We have other bills making it um, more difficult for people to get transfer payments. I won't give up on the Biden administration trying to do something now. You know, he talks about wanting to run for president again, and I think he's vulnerable on that issue. Apparently, he's going to send some National Guard members down there, which he didn't do for the last two years. And I assume that is because now he's running for election and wants to look at Mr. I'm enforcing the border. So I think we just have to highlight all that's going on there and hope for political reasons, even though it's not in his heart, he does something to <coughs> stop the flow of people coming across the border. I, want, I mentioned the fentanyl poisoning. And I want to talk about the size of it, too, so people realize that. I'm old enough, as there's some other people in the room, to remember the Vietnam War. 
And during the Vietnam War, there were a lot of protests and people talked about all the people who died in the Vietnam War. The total number of people who died in the Vietnam War over 12 years was 57,000 Americans. Every year, 107,000 Americans die of illegal drug usage. 107,000. I mean, um, I right now am authoring a bill uh, making it easier to get a mandatory minimum on people who have fentanyl and increase the minimum if they're bringing it across the southern border. Um, right now, of course, the President Biden is more. We have too many people in jail. But we have 107,000 people dying. Uh, that's outlandish. I think these drugs, or at least the ingredients for the drugs, are being initiated in China, too. We had a hearing on that last week. I asked some questions about it. And I don't think enough is being done there. I mean, if they had been doing something in China that say 100,000 Americans were obviously killed because of Chinese actions. it would be an act of war. Uh, this fentanyl is not killing tons of people in China, right? They've made sure of that. Their own citizens are dying. It's our citizens are dying. And I think the Biden administration, insofar as he deals with China, um, ought to be weighing in for a little bit more action on their end as well. Yes? All right. Next up, we'll have Barb from Mayville concerning the debt ceiling. I, I think we've already covered your ideas about the debt ceiling, but isn't the debt ceiling something that we've already incurred those, those, um, Well, no, we're, we're, we can, we can do what I can, like I said, going forward. Um, and then during the budget time, that's when you, you negotiate. We want to do it then, too. I mean, it just seems irresponsible when you have almost record levels of debt. And we're headed towards a record that we didn't even get after World War II. Right, but isn't this affecting the stock market and stuff right now? People yes. are getting nervous and yes. saying, hey, do well, something right now. We're, we're just getting scared. Well, uh, I guess either side could do something. Uh, we, do not, we, do not, yeah, we do not expect uh, President Biden to do what, what everything we throw do? out there. What is Congress Well, Congress doing? last week passed our proposal. Okay. And one of the reasons that uh, President Biden said he would not negotiate with the Republicans. He didn't think the Republicans would ever be able to get their act together and have over half the vote <coughs> vote for a proposal. We did that last week, which is, I assume, why yesterday President Biden said now he was going to meet with the four leaders in Congress. I hope he does it. I hope he's sincere. I'm not a Pollyanna on this thing. You know, to be honest, if the Republicans get 10 or 15 percent of what they're asking for, I would consider that a victory. Um, because you're right, at the end of the day, we can't allow an American to fall. But, um, Why was this passed three times under Trump, but not under Biden? I'm just well, I don't think we're anywhere near this crisis of what we are right now. Yeah, we were. Yeah, we were. We were, we were very no, close. No, 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 no. We're, we're at 100 percent right now, like I said. Almost 100 percent of GDP. A few years ago, much longer, I'm sure, 75-ish, I can look at the numbers, but we, we, are, we have a debt increasing it just a phenomenal why? rate. Why, are we, why is our, is it because of tax cuts on the, on the bridge? Uh, no. No? Um, are you sure? it, it is because of a, 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 a huge increase in spending both on the COVID and more recently. So what would you um, cut then? Well, I will, I'll try to keep to one question. We are just trying to return to the level of spending that was a year ago. We are not including any specific areas. I mentioned we are highlighting the transfer payments and that people are not having to work for. Uh, I think other agencies, though, have to take significant cuts. You seem like somebody who is up to speed on what's going well, on. Well, I have two sons in the military. Right. And I'm and, terrified uh, they're not going to get paid. If well, I, I wouldn't that. worry about that. We, OK, we've thank always you. Thank you. Wouldn't worry about I, that. OK. All right. Next up, we will have Dean from Pickett concerning NGOs. Yes, this is a curiosity question. So you got these non-government organizations, typically nonprofits. I know they're in Mexico, they're at the border, they're in the United States. How much are they facilitating some of this illegal immigration? And if they are, is there anything we can do to choke that off? Um, well, we are writing a letter to try to get more information on the amount of money that's going to those NGOs. I think there is a feeling those NGOs are even incurring illegal immigration. I mentioned the unaccompanied minors that are coming across the border, some of which are supposed to be looked out for by the NGOs. And 
to be honest, it's been very disappointing or difficult to get information um, as far as what's going on there. Uh, but there is no shortage of people in this country who I think are not thrilled with enforcing immigration laws. Look at all the sanctuary cities, the sanctuary counties, the sanctuary states, which are clearly encouraging people to come here. They shouldn't be doing it, but we all know that a lot of the illegals are, are getting money transfer payments, which is an inducement to come here. And uh, I think all we can do to shine a light on it will be good, because I think some of those NGOs are perhaps connected to churches, and people would want to know that. Yeah. All right. Next up, we'll have Rebecca from Ripon concerning artificial intelligence. Yes, I don't think it is anything that should be passed because they want to try and say, tell you what, how to think about different things in the way that they do your decisioning for you and how does that base on a person that's a Christian like myself. Um, I think you're talking about artificial intelligence, and it's a very scary thing. Uh, you have people looking to increase the power of the government, the suggestibility of the government. Um, we are working on a bill, hopefully uh, getting the government out of that business or not able to affect individual citizens. It is a very scary thing, and I'm glad you're keeping track of it. All right, next up we'll have David from Beaver Dam concerning uh, the military. My question is more in regards to electrifying the military in an attempt to save the planet. Is that going to, is, is an electric vehicle going to make our military more efficient? And is it going to save our soldiers' lives? I don't necessarily believe that's true. It's obviously a new thing. Um, but I, um, you know, it's something perhaps I could have a hearing on, we could talk about it later. Um, I do not consider it something that is realistically going to happen in the next few years, whatever anybody says. Okay. okay. They said by 30. That, that's their goal, and like I said, I think realistically, just as we talk about electric cars being all over the place in six years, I, I don't think that technology is such that the military will be able to electrify everything within the next seven or eight years. Next up, we'll have Theodore from Wapan about uh, the extent of Chinese involvement in Silicon Valley. Have you yeah. found out if uh, the Chinese had operatives in the Silicon Valley bank collapse? If were, were there people, Chinese that were investors that were repaid their indiscretion with our funds? Uh, I'm sure over time our, our uh, financial committees will look at it. I don't have any hard answers now. I want to come back here on this military thing as well. Um, I do believe that Congress has spent too much money on things that I don't think are what our military needs more than anything else. Um, you know, you have all this, you always have this saying that the military is always fighting the last war. And one year that I, one area that I'm weighing in on is with regard to air killers. Okay, right now, I think some unnecessarily inflammatory things have been said by members of Congress, and I think we are in closer to a war, which we have no business being involved in, with either Russia or China that we have in quite a time. And I think a little bit of that is inflammatory things that have been said. That being said, when you look at what would happen in a war, um, I do not feel Congress is doing enough to looking at what a future war would look like. Okay, hypersonic missiles, that sort of thing. Nevertheless, we have 11 or 12 aircraft carriers. Uh, about a year ago, they did war games with France, and I think the, the U.S. Teddy Roosevelt was the aircraft carrier that was part of it. It was sunk almost immediately because it is so big and slow compared to the missiles that go after the <coughs> French submarines to sink at a body here at home. I think the fact that we still have so many aircraft carriers is an indication that Congress is kind of reliving World War II. 
You would even say what happened in the Battle of the Midway. Maybe uh, aircraft carriers were shown to be a little bit uh, overutilized even at that time. But uh, when the arm, I, my subcommittee does have a chance to look at military spending, and the one area that I'm going to question is all of these aircraft carriers. <coughs> There's still a point the aircraft carriers are not fighting a top flight military power. You know, if you want to do a bombing run off over some third world country because of some terrorism, I think an aircraft carrier is fine. It also is very impressive. So impressive that I think it, it sends a message just being there. But the idea that clearly our military believes in an all-out war, aircraft carriers are still going to play a big role when people who I talk to and I trust will tell you that given the missiles they have that are submarines, uh, they would be in a lot of trouble with a war against China or North Korea. And uh, maybe part of the thing is, too, when you build new aircraft carriers, they're very expensive, it provides a lot of jobs for people. But when we put together our military, we want to be looking for what's best for our military and protecting our country, not who's ever, whatever else motivates congressmen, including where they build stuff. Okay, next war. Next, next one. Yep. Questions? Sandra from Lamira, concerning tax breaks for yachts and privately owned planes. Yeah. Why, we, why don't we you say we don't have any money? We're not taxing the rich. We were letting them have the deductions on yachts and their, oh my God, the poor guy's got to put gas in his, in his private jet. The rest of us, we go to get our taxes. You can't really deduct anything because it isn't um, there. And number one, aren't you guys being elected by us? Are we paying your salary? And nobody's listening to us, but isn't it, isn't it to say the majority rule of them in the United States? I, I don't think so. I get out and about and listen to everybody frequently. That's why I'm having these listening sessions. That's why on weekends I am all over the district talking to people. I think what you are going to want to revisit is the tax cuts that were passed in, uh, in 2015. And I will tell you, having sat in the room, a lot was done to try to make sure these tax cuts didn't favor the rich. I can tell you that almost the only people who come up to me and complain that their taxes went up after 2015 are people that you and I would call rich. And that's because we got rid of the deduction for state and local income taxes. The people who benefit with that deduction more than anybody else are the well-off people. I don't want to, I'm not going to, because they were private conversations. But I can tell you some well-off people in this district have been mad at me for voting for those tax cuts because their taxes went up. No, no, you're talking about, we, about taking away the veterans? Uh, the uh, veterans, you're no. cutting them? You're going to cut uh, the school? I'll deal with that because we already need a, a couple other questions. Yeah. On the veterans thing, like I said, the Republican position on the cuts that have to be made um, when dealing with the debt limit are an across-the-board cut. If you'll notice over time, we do not cut veterans, okay? And uh, the key Republicans in charge of negotiating a deal or negotiating the budget, if they would agree to cross the board cuts, have publicly said we are not going to cut veterans benefits. So that is only partisan speculation, and both of the relevant congressmen who I'll have more to say about that decision than anybody have promised we're not going to cut that. Okay, I'm just saying, remember who's paying your tax, who's paying your salary. It's not the big guy, it's us. It's us who's paying your salary. You're very kind. All right, next we'll have George from Wapan concerning the border. Yes, uh, what is it actually going to take to close the border? Well, the most important thing is the ability to just to send people back to Mexico. Of all the decisions President Biden has made, even decisions regarding the amount of spending, nothing was a bigger mistake, or maybe it wasn't a mistake, than saying you can come into the United States and wait for your hearing. Okay, these people are coming across the border because the power of the Mexican cartels, they're paying five, 10, if they're coming from India, maybe $20,000 to get it. If we go back to the old system of saying, you wait in Mexico until we have your hearing, people are not going to spend $20,000 coming from India to this country with the threat of losing $20,000. The only reason so many people are coming here is because we're letting them across the border and saying, you show up for a hearing in a year, in a year, or two years, or three years, and they don't shut up. So if they go back to that, 
they, they will solve the vast, the vast amount of the problem. Now there are other things they should do as well. Um, in the, the place where we were along the Arizona-Mexican border, in part because it was an Indian reservation, we just had these kind of cross things along there so cars couldn't come across, but it was very easy to people, for people to come across. And insofar as we build what they call a wall system, that will also make it much easier for the Border Patrol. Another thing they could be doing is they could be deporting people with broken laws. Right now they're deporting people at about a quarter of the rate they were being deported under President Trump. You know, you're able to commit worse crimes and not get kicked out of the country, which would also show good faith in uh, trying to shore up the border. Uh, like with this highest killing, this uh, neighbor that killed those five, I believe it was five. Right. Um, he's been in and out of this country how many times? About four or five times. Right, things are very porous right now. And um, we do, when people turn themselves in, we do try to do a background check. But that background check is only on crimes committed in America or crimes committed in Canada. Somebody can commit all sorts of horrific crimes in El Salvador or Nicaragua and we'll be able to catch that. There's another problem. Thank you. Next, we'll have Mike from North Fond du Lac concerning HR 82. Hey, Congressman, um, we have um, a retired letter carrier. I'm um, just wondering if you have, uh, we're hoping that you have some interest in signing on to HR 82, the repeal of Social Security's windfall uh, benefit uh, reduction and government pension offset. And it's basically for folks that aren't familiar. It's uh, federal employees under the old service, civil service system. At a second job, they paid into Social Security at the full rate. But when they retired, they would only collect Social Security at a reduced rate. So um, just wondering if you um, are planning to sign on to that. And we want to, uh, I, thank I, you for your support. Yeah. Pass the letter first. I am, uh, I am supportive of the post office. You know that uh, right now, you know, there are all sorts of concerns about Social Security. And I realize how, in some ways, you would feel that we should have this benefit. Um, on the other hand, Social Security is, is just in deep, deep trouble. And uh, I don't think that's going to pass in the near future just because brass tax. Uh, we want to keep Social Security there. And I realize it's a relatively small dollar amount. But uh, and I'll look at it again because I can understand the argument why you feel you ought to get, get something for that. There, there are also uh, windfalls from, quite frankly, illegal immigrants working here, right? That the Social Security system gets a windfall. But uh, right now, they say Social Security is going to run out in, uh, I think, what, 32, 33, something like that. And to pass a bill that's going to accelerate when Social Security runs out of mo money. I just don't think it's going to happen, but I'll look at it again. We've talked about it before, and I'll talk to you about it later. All right, next up, we'll have Meg from Beaver Dam concerning child care funding across the state. That's fine. Pardon me for my lack of voice, but I was just wondering what your stance was on continuing funding for child care programs and initiatives that help support uh, child care programs across the state and across the nation to continue to function as it is an essential service to working families. Right. Um, again, you're talking about something that is a significant spending commitment. Um, I, uh, but it's also an investment in the future. Well, everybody says it's an investment, but most of what Congress has passed is an investment. And so the debt keeps getting greater. But this is a literal investment in our future and our kids. Right. Well, um, we'll look at it. Maybe the state will look at it. Um, but like I said, I'm just being realistic. We are in a situation in which the debt is proportionate to GDP keeps going up uh, to record levels. And when I sit in my office in Washington, not everybody, but almost everybody who has an appointment with me wants to spend more money. And they've all got good reasons, um, but like I said, we are so broke that I think a new, a significant new commitment is going to be difficult to get through. I mean, uh, and I'm just trying to be realistic with you. I have toured daycare centers in the past. 
Um, maybe I, I'd be happy to go through yours and hear some of the stories. Oh, I work to support families in working programs. You, you work for a daycare center? No, I work for the Wisconsin Early Childhood Association. Oh. I work to support child care providers across the okay. state by allowing them a stipend every six months to okay. support their well-being and their livelihoods. Okay. Well, I, I will try to make a point to do or some of the daycares in my district soon and, and get their get their viewpoint. And please ask working families if they are going to instead have to decide on one parent being a stay-at-home parent if their child care would. It's one of the options that's out there, and I have talked to women. For, just, for whatever reason, it appears to be more likely women wouldn't have to be or staying at home, or wish they could work, but because of the lack of daycare, they're, they're taking care of their own kids. Next up, we'll go to Kathy from Brandon. Hi, I'm Kathy. My question is, um, when you give an allotment to a school system or a county, do you give them the full amount that you, you say you're going to, or do you deduct some of it? I don't know exactly what you mean by that. Well, they're, they're saying that the reason they do referendums is because they're not getting the amount that you're supposed to be giving them from the state. Um, well, first of all, I think what you're talking about is the state level, because usually the state is the ones who give most of the money to the school right. and give most of the money to the municipalities. Mike, do you want to respond to that or do you want me to respond to it? Um, all I can say is that the talk is that we don't put enough into education. But if you look at a chart, our spending in the state has gone up like this, mm -hmm. $16 billion. It's, it's the second biggest area in our budget that we spent in the last budget. Okay, but Out their excuse for a referendum is that you're not paying your bills. Well, no, no it, That's what I thought. It, it's per pupil, um, and we put it in the budget, and we just we have to distribute it. If we put it in and we pass it, if I found out as a legislator that we didn't spend that money, I'd be pretty ticked off. So they're getting it. A lot of times the referendum is for a new building. And for operating budgets, operating referendums with declining enrollment, and most schools are in declining enrollment. But no, we can't keep the money. If it's budgeted and we pass the budget, it gets sent out. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. Yeah, okay. Um, let me take one more and then I'll go back to a couple of these I'm going to touch on. Sounds good. So we will go to Lori from Fox Lake concerning um, birth control methods. So on your website it states that you um, believe that life begins at conception when the egg and sperm come together. But some of the most effective birth control methods work uh, at um, impacting implantation of the egg and the sperm or the fertilized egg into the uterus. So what measures would you take or support that would take away birth control methods that, that are blocking implantation? I, I don't think there's any effort being made right now in Congress to ban or uh, prevent traditional birth control methods, including those uh, the preventive implantation that I'm aware of. I don't think that's something that's going to happen. Um, now, uh, I want to touch on a couple other things. Um, I want to mention uh, um, manufacturing a little bit and what we're trying to do to help manufacturing in the state. And, and good news, uh, over the last several years, Wisconsin has been the second the state that's second in the country in percentage of workforce involved in manufacturing. Okay, and that's kind of incredible because a lot of people just associate with Wisconsin with cheese, which is a form of manufacturing, but not enough people know we're number two in the country. I found out last week we hit number one in the country, which is kind of a cool thing, right? Um, we have more manufacturing per, or more manufacturing employees uh, 400,000 people than anywhere else in the country. Number two by a, a, a smidge is Indiana, and number three, a distant drop between two and three is Michigan. Uh, I think for that reason, insofar as we pass a new education bill, 
is more, more skills based. I think we have probably too many people going to four year colleges in this country right now. Whenever you go to manufacturers, particularly with regard to skill manufacturing, they want more people. It'd be better if we had more apprenticeship type programs beginning in high school. I think it'd be good if we more incentivized people to go to technical school than college. The Wall Street Journal ran an article a while back uh, saying that a plumber uh, has an expectancy to make more money than a, a family doctor, not a specialist, but a family doctor over the course of their lifetime, which I think is true. And uh, it's amazing in manufacturing, construction, the number of jobs that are out there. We've got to continue to work towards that. But I do think we've got to do a better job of publicizing how much manufacturing we have in the state of Wisconsin. And it's something we can all be proud of. Um, in good news, we recently um, found out that uh, some Christians who were in prison in Vietnam that I had been trying to get out, they succeeded. They wanted a congressman to help. And uh, I thought, I'll try, but why would they care what an individual congressman says? We got a few out of prison, so we're, we're working on hopefully trying to get a few more out of prison, which is some good news that's on <coughs> uh, Again, with regard to manufacturing, when I was in the state legislature, I worked on a uh, bill creating a special low rate for manufacturing in Wisconsin because other states like Texas and Florida, um, they, they already have no income tax at all. Um, but I think on a national level, we are competing with China. And part of the decision as to where you're going to do manufacturing, particularly these big multinationals, does come down to, to, to tax rates. Nothing against Walmart, but we're not a great country because we have a lot of Walmarts. Or we're not a great country because we have a lot of law firms. We're a great country because we make things. And I think the tax code should be aimed at manufacturing. I talked to the head of the Ways and Means, which is a big committee that deals with taxes on the Republican side, and the chairman said he did want to do something to help manufacturing. So I've got to brought him along there. Maybe we're going to be able to get something done in the next two years, more likely the two years after that. But I would love to be able to do something on a national level, similar to what we did on a state level when I was here. Um, and uh, two other things to touch upon. Um, the transgender situation. Who wouldn't think it is that significant because it must be such a tiny segment of the population. But the Democrat Party spends a lot of time talking about it. I've read a book on the topic. I think the vast majority of people would uh, you know, come out of it or just be a phase um, if it was not drilled into people. And uh, I really object to what is being done with the Department of Education today where you try to do more and more you can, more and more that you can, to I guess we'll say normalize something that a lot of people will, will work their way out of. Um, and the final thing I'll touch upon, we are doing, or we are making work requirements in the Republican proposal on raising the debt limit. I think we ought to be doing a lot more uh, with what I'll call the welfare formulas right now. We are discouraging work, we are discouraging marriage. And I think a lot of America's problems today began in the 1960s when they really ramped up these programs and uh, did a lot to destroy the American family. So I hope that uh, the Republicans uh, begin to use this a little bit more in upcoming elections and we'll fine tune some of these programs more two years from now. Why don't we move over to Ron really quick uh, for our last question and then we'll wrap things up here. Thanks for coming to Wapana again, Glenn. Um, it's kind of interesting, you were just talking about welfare reform. One thing I've learned from you over the years is that the 6th Congressional District of Wisconsin has more manufacturing jobs in it than any other congressional district in the whole country. And as the mayor, like you as the congressman, I tour local businesses and manufacturers. They've all got a help on it sign up. They're all starting at $17 an hour and up. No one's even talking about minimum wage anymore. And at a time like this, and with uh, the budget deficit you've been talking about, I think reforming and or somehow cutting welfare is a good place to start because the employers are begging for help. So at this time, there's no reason to pay people to stay home. Well, right. And you know, we sometimes hear about the low unemployment. We do have a historical unemployment right now. 
But then you have to look at the percentage of people in the workforce. And while we have very few people who are looking for a job who can't find a job, we have more people who start who aren't even looking for a job in the first place. And I think part of that uh, sadly comes from the, the government programs that, uh, and you know, I don't care which benefits you're looking at, all benefits kind of operate on uh, computing percent of poverty, and as a result, all the programs discourage people from making too much more money or discourage people from getting married. One of the bills that I have that I, I forgot to talk about, and I would like to see this as well, like so many other bills, it might in the short term um, decrease the amount of com money coming into the Treasury. Right now, if you're retired on Social Security and you make more than $20,000 a year, they begin to take away your Social Security benefits. I think this is more common over time, in part because of inflation. More older people want to get back in the workforce, and secondly, they might know they just regret retiring and wish they had some, some more time. But if you make more than $20,000, they begin to take away your benefits. And if you talk to people, I don't care whether you're talking home care, who you're talking to, again and again, they have employees who say, I can only work two days a week because I'll lose my Social Security benefits. My bill would try to go up from $20,000 to $30,000. So for those people who work, say, three days instead of two days a week and do a little bit to solve our huge problem, which is a lack of people working an employee, an employee shortage. Okay. about artificial intelligence, I, that, right. isn't there something for people that have cerebral palsy or certain stuff and they need brain things put in them and in time? I we, have, we, we, I'll talk to you after we break up here. Do you have, are all the questions been answered? We're good now. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for all being here. Was a good turnout. Um, very good. I'm walking around your alleyways for a little bit.